Hello, hello everybody and thank you all for joining this online webinar at the London School of Economics International Inequalities Institute on the politics of inequality, why should we focus on resistance from below? As we gather here today, tens of thousands of farmers are protesting in India to challenge laws that threaten to bring private investment into agriculture, which will leave farmers at the mercy of corporate interests. Last summer, Black Lives Matter's movement spread across the Atlantic from the US and have ensured that many institutions, not least the university, need to reflect and act much more on issues of racial justice. The year before, climate justice protests rocked many countries in 2019, you know, I'm cherry picking my examples here, but I do so to illustrate that grassroots challenges to inequalities and injustices around the world remain as important as ever. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of a new research theme at the London School of Economics and Political Science at the International Inequalities Institute a theme on the politics of inequality, a theme which explores the grassroots challenges to inequalities from the everyday resistance to organized protests and social movements to revolutionary upsurges, a theme which invites us to move from the ivory towers of our privileged institutions into the despair and hope, the murk and the organization, the despondence and the spirit of trying to bring about social change from below. Themes at the London School of Economics International Inequalities Institute aim to provide a platform for research, deliberation and discussion, a space in which to forge new collaborations, both within academia, but also with those working outside. They aim to provide new analysis on inequalities, rejuvenate old approaches where necessary, critical reflections on policy implications and support strategies for political mobilization. I, I am Alpa Shah, an Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the LSE and convener of another research theme at the International Inequalities Institute, a theme on the global economies of care. Much of my own research, however, uh, has focused on Marx, Lenin and Mao inspired revolutionary struggle in India and the question of why ordinary people might take up arms to challenge inequalities and also how they may undermine the aims of their struggle. So it's a real privilege to ch chair today's session on the politics of inequality. And I do so also in the spirit of forging links between the various research themes that we ho hope to nurture at the III. The politics of inequality theme was launched jointly by Armin Ishkanian, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Social Policy and also the Executive Director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Programme at the III, and Ellen Helsper, Professor who is, um, works on digital inequalities in the Department of Media and Communications. Armin's work examines the politics and practices of mobilization and resistance against social, economic and political inequalities and the ways in which a range of actors working within civil society engage in policy processes and wider social and political transformation. Ellen has been exploring how inequalities are both amplified and contested in increasingly digital societies. She examines how the diffusion of information, communication, technology, access, skills, and content creation and consumption can both help or hinder participation of historically disadvantaged groups. I am delighted that Armin, Ellen, and I are joined today by three brilliant colleagues from across the LSE who are all doing important work on the politics of inequality. Let me introduce each in the order that they will speak. The first is Sumi Madok from the Gender Studies Department, where she is Associate Professor. Of Sumi's many achievements and books, I will mention one major one, which is about to be published next month, in fact, a book, Vernacular Rights Cultures, 
Through this work, Sumi decolonizes and decenters the European, the Europe, Eurocentrism of global human rights and explores a wide range of political imaginaries, critical conceptual vocabularies, and gendered political struggles for rights and justice that animate sub subaltern mobilization in most parts of the world. I'm very excited to read this new book, which prom promises to be an important critique of human rights, yet at the same time, widen how we should center both rights and justice in our concern for inequalities. The second speaker is Flora Cornish, an associate professor of qualitative research methodology in the Department of Methodology. She's also a community psychologist. Over the last 20 years, Flora has theorized and empirically documented the power and challenges of community-led responses to public health crises and disasters. Flora told me that Indian sex workers organizations responding to the HIV AIDS crisis have taught her the most of what she knows about the resistance from below. But today, she is going to focus on work she has been doing over the last three years with residents and community groups here in London, in North Kensington, to document and analyze the struggle for post-disaster recovery. In the aftermath of the Grenfell disaster, she's just published a paper in the journal Critical Public Health on activism after Grenfell, which she will draw on today. And the final contributor today is John Charcraft, a professor of Middle East history and politics in the Department of Government. John has written a series of important major books on popular politics in the Middle East, defying authorities, on cabbies striking in, striking in Egypt, on Syrian migrant workers in Lebanon, and on counter hegemony in the colony and post colony. colony. Today, he is going to focus on thinking through Gramscian approaches in considering politics from below. So, as you can see, we have a wonderful panel today, not only coming from many disciplinary orientations, but also having done work in different parts of the globe to address a common theme. To focus our discussion, I have asked the panel to each discuss three issues based on insights from their own work. So let me tell you what those three issues are. The first is what should we focus on, sorry, why should we focus on resistance from below? Second is what are their theoretical, empirical and methodolo methodological approaches in studying resistance from below? And the final question is from the perspective of their own work, what do they see as the way forward for this theme? What should be its vision? What should be its ambition? What role should the theme play, both theoretically, empirically, but and of course also politically. But before I ask the panel to do that, I'd like to invite Armin Ishkanian and Ellen Halsberg, the co-conveners of this new theme, to say just a few words about the theme and why they launched it. Over to you, Armin and Ellen. Thank you, Alpa. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And you, all your support for the theme. So I'll speak very briefly about why we launched this theme. Um, the, one of the key reasons of launching this theme was to provide a platform for those researching forms of resistance, mobilization, and collective action against a range of social, economic, and political inequalities, um, working in the LSE, but also beyond it. And as part of the work on the theme, we're very interested in examining mobilization from below from a comparative, international, and also intersectional perspective. The idea is that this theme will also complement and work with the other themes at the International Inequalities Institute, and also doing by doing so, bring a very strong focus on actions, practices, and ideas from below, or as some refer to it, from the everyday. I'd also like to add that the politics of inequality theme is closely linked to the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program, AFSI, which is based at the International Inequalities Institute. And AFSI is one of seven interconnected Atlantic Fellows programs from across the globe. As a program, we draw on the insights of academic research, innovative social change strategies, 
and our fellows' own expertise to envision and explore alternatives to the world's deeply unequal economic, political, legal, and social structures. The idea here is that the research from the politics of inequality theme will inform teaching on the fellowship program, support fellows projects and dissertations, and also include fellows in the themes ongoing development. I'll stop here and turn over to Ellen. Thank you, Armin. And thank you very much, Alpa, for chairing this uh, wonderful event. It's very exciting to be launching a new theme that has a slightly different approach from the other themes that um, the III has already organized. I think uh, Armin has said almost anything that I could say about uh, where this theme emerged from. And I think the most important thing is its, it's emphasis on the below, on the everyday, on how people resist and um, sometimes reproduce inequalities in their everyday lives through ordinary, but also through uh, extraordinary actions. And that's really what we are looking at in this theme. The everyday, the bottom up, resistance, through. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Amin. Thank you, Ellen. I'm going to soon begin uh, our panel discussion, but before I hand over to the speakers, a note on upcoming events at the III. On Tuesday, 2nd of February, this, this year, the III seminar series will host an event which is entitled The Economic Consequences of Major Tax Cuts of, on the Rich. So this is going to be at 12.30 um, and, and with David Hope, uh, Dr. Julian Lindbergh and Donna Luk, Dr. Luna Glucksberg, who's going to chair. Uh, I'm going to be back uh, on Thursday, the 4th of February at 6 p.m. to chair an III LSC public event where we will discuss the crisis of care we are amidst, why we need to build a caring economy and how to do it. I'm going to be joined by three fabulous authors who have just launched three major publications on care, Madeline Bunting, Professor Diane Alson and Professor Lynn Segal. But let's now turn to our speakers for today. So first, we're going to follow the, have the following order. First, we'll begin with uh, uh, Dr. Sumi Madok, then Flora Cornish, John Chalcroft, Ellen Halspa, and Armin uh, Ishkanyan at the end. So to remind you of the questions that they're addressing, why should we focus on resistance from below? What are the theoretical, empirical, and methodological approaches in studying resistance from below? From the perspective of their work, what do they see as the way forward for this theme, its vision and its ambition? What should it be? Over to you, Sumi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alpa. Thank you for chairing and for the wonderful introduction and for setting the context for our conversations this afternoon. Thank you, Ellen and Armin, for leading this wonderful and important theme. And, and hello, everyone. I'm delighted and excited to be a part of the launch of this new and extraordinarily important uh, theme of the politics of inequality. So as Alpa set out the questions for us, and I'm going to try and um, engage with them, um, why should we focus on resistance from below? For me, it essentially boils down to three things. Firstly, to produce epistemic shifts in global knowledge production. Secondly, to disrupt the existing epistemic inequalities and hierarchies around the globe. And finally, to enable new imaginaries, possibilities, and visions for radical equality and justice, and for a new social order outside of racial capitalism. My own intervention into debates on countering epistemic inequality and prevailing coloniality has been to call for conceptual diversity in the social sciences, and to call for producing concepts from the global south. Concepts are the building blocks of theory, and they enable us to visualize the world. Importantly, they enable us to envision, but also to tell different stories of world making. For some years now, I've been insistent to tell a different story of world making around rights and global human rights. I tell a story of vernacular rights cultures. The stories of vernacular rights cultures foreground the struggles for rights and justice by subaltern groups in most of the world. These are stories of critical conceptual vocabularies, of subaltern mobilizations, and of conflictual gendered politics of rights. 
They are the stories of struggles for economic redistributive justice, but also for representational justice. And they are stories of conceptual diversity, of oppositional politics, of protest against authoritarianism and of authoritarian nation states, and of the political imaginaries that animate subaltern politics, uh, but also open up different futures and possibilities for rights and human rights in most of the world. But importantly, these stories refuse the racialized, originary and binary global human rights talk, or what I call the politics of origins. The politics of origins divides the globe and divides global human rights discourse into a series of binary distinctions. And the key ones being, and you know these, these very well, I mean, they are at the forefront of our mind's eye all of the time, right? So the key ones being between West and non-West, between universalism versus cultural particularism, Asian values versus politi uh, Western political and civil human rights, and so on. In the hands of authoritarian political regimes, this politics of origins works a treat to delegitimize the democratic politics of dissent, rights and justice on the basis that human rights are foreign, they're alien, they're not part of cultural values, right, and therefore have no legitimate recognition. And within celebratory and critical scholarship on human rights, it shores up the West as the epistemic subject of human rights through displaying willful ignorance and colonial unknowing around rights struggles in most of the world. In fact, as we speak, you know, the world is ablaze with rights politics, right? Um, and, and some of which Alpa alluded to in her introduction. The vernacular in vernacular rights cultures flags the different literal and conceptual languages of rights deployed by subaltern groups in most of the world. In my work, I have taken uh, my cue from the principal word signifying a right in South Asia, which is the word hak. The word hak, of course, is hardly confined to South Asia alone. It is, of course, the word for a right that is used across two continents and is, appears in at least seven different languages, including Hebrew, Persian, Arabic, Swahili, Turkish, and Urdu, where it operates as a right. For over a decade, I've been tracking the deployment of Haq in Northwest India, from Rajasthan's eastern regions, where, which are mostly rocky, thorn scrub forested and sand filled terrains, to the Aravli Hills in its south where subaltern groups have mobilized to demand rights to food, public information, gender and caste equality, and employment from the state, and where indigenous peoples have demanded the rights to their sacred and ancestral forests, streams, and lands. The word hak doesn't recognize national borders. If anything, it undermines them. And so I have traveled with it further northwest into the subcontinent, and into the green plains of the Punjab in Pakistan, where for the last 18 years, very poor peasants have waged a struggle for land rights and taken on the might of Pakistan's military to emerge as the most significant working class struggle in post-colonial Pakistan. So how to study these subaltern mobilizations around the globe and how to narrate the stories of vernacular rights cultures without falling into traps that readily culturalize epistemic difference or convert any kind of epistemic difference into local or as case studies of global human rights. In order to avoid these epistemic erasures and willful ignorance, I've had to devise a set of methodological tools for studying rights politics in most of the world. And these multi-hued set of tools is what I call feminist historical ontologies. A feminist historical ontology couples investigation into historical ontology with a critical reflexive politics of location. So it's a coupling together of philosophical investigations into historical ontology together with an acute uh, awareness of a critical reflexive politics of location. A feminist historical ontology allows us to examine how concepts come into being in different parts of the globe and how they produce particular political cultures of rights, justice, resistance, and how they make up people while putting in place different possibilities for justice and democracy. My vision for the politics of inequalities theme, and I'm super excited about it, as you know, um, my vision for the theme is that it will enable us to come together to produce scholarship for global justice. 
And secondly, that it will help build transnational bridges among different mobilizations and resistance movements across the globe and help establish and solidify networks of transnational solidarity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sumi Madok. Um, it was a wonderful uh, reflection on concepts from below and why they're so important. And I'm, I'm sure we're gonna take this up in, in other parts of the conversation. But for now, over to Flora Cornish. Uh, please, Flora, go ahead. Thank you very much, Alpa. Um, I'll get straight into it. Why should we focus on resistance from below? In short, because against the elite serving hope crushing inertia in systems of power, the resolute insistence on and enactment of alternatives by those who bear the brunt of inequalities, who live their effects and who know how to look after humanity differently is a beacon of hope we need. I say this from the perspective of having worked with residents and colleagues in North Kensington over the last three and a half years in the aftermath of the Grenfell Tower disaster. As you know, at Grenfell, a devastating fire consumed a block of flats, taking 72 precious lives. The horror that such a thing could happen in 21st century Britain, no less, led to a chorus of politicians, housing professionals, residents proclaiming that Grenfell changes everything. And so people affected by the disaster threw their energies into demanding change, change to fire and construction regulations, to the state's willingness to listen to residents in social housing, to the relation between community and state in North Kensington, to the care and support for local residents. But rather than structures and powerful actors welcoming change, the experience has been one of dismissal, sidestepping, delay, obfuscation and setback. Wins have been partial and campaigners have to be continually vigilant to possible co-option or distractions in a hugely frustrating journey of moves in fits and starts and blockages. Then in striking contrast to this journey of setbacks and rejections is the vitality and dependability of community support and solidarity. On the 14th day of every month, that's the anniversary of the fire, uh, disrupted only by the COVID-19 crisis, um, but on the 14th come winds or losses, rain or shine, in light and darkness as the seasons pass, a silent walk proceeds around the streets of North Kensington, remembering the dead and committing to justice. Community groups support their members day in, day out, surviving funding cuts and institutional obstruction. But overall, I think it's fair to say, particularly in relation to the demands for structural change, that over the last three years, it has been a bitter realization to stomach that Grenfell does not change everything. And I anticipate that activists from other contexts will recognize this type of trajectory of repeated denial and delay. And I think if we conceptualize the purpose of resistance from below as the successful achievement of milestone goals, we'll spend a lot of time talking about failure and find it hard to avoid despair. But my argument is that setbacks do not invalidate a struggle or warrant despair, but that in insisting on caring for others' lives, such as through continuing to demand changes to regulations, even while those demands aren't yet successful, resistance from below succeeds in instantiating a caring world. So um, my approach, um, theoretically, I've sought to understand and value the impetus of this activism that refuses to be ground down by delay or to despair at the inertia, to value that activism, even when it's not being overtly successful. I've drawn on Donna Haraway's ideas of staying with the trouble as a position that can hold simultaneously both the fact of catastrophic loss and the inspirational healing of relations of care and solidarity. And I've developed a focus on the staying power of determined resistance from below, from those who know from experience that protection of life is right and justice is worth waiting and fighting for. Methodologically, I ground my work in the praxis of ongoing struggles through engaged ethnography and knowledge exchange with communities, which links to my point for the third um, 
um, issue that ALPA has asked us to address the way forward for this theme. And I'll mention just one point. I think it's important for this theme that academic research in elite institutions is not the originator or center of radical reimagining and recreating of more equal worlds. That's being done in practice by people insisting on relations of care and solidarity in their worlds, imagining alternatives and making them real. I would hope that people working with this theme do not aspire to tell the world how it is, but to see the theme as a node of engagement of ideas and practice with communities and campaigners at the sharp end of inequalities in making liberatory knowledge and action together. Thank you. Thank you, Flora. That was powerful, um, moving, important. And to Sumi's important ideas of concepts from grassroots from below, you've added how we ought to look at movements themselves, even when they're failing as a space for a new kind of politics, a politics of, you know, that that's caring, a more caring politics as a kind of prefigurative politics. I mean, I don't know if you want to add all those labels. We can have those discussions later. But yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And now, John, uh, over to you, uh, John Charlecraft. Uh, maybe you will have some important reflections uh, bringing Gramsci to, to the table. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alpa, for that lovely introduction. And to, to, to Sumi and Flora, and especially, of course, to Armin and Ellen and the Triple I for establishing this, this, uh, this, this theme, which I think is enormously important. So why should we look at resistance from below? Well, surely one reason for doing so is that we need to be able to distinguish and uh, in the present context between different forms of popular politics, different forms of popular mobilization, not just for academic reasons, but also because of the urgency of the situation. Don't we need to be able to distinguish between right-wing populism in both secular and religious forms of the kinds shown on this slide, from Bolsonaro in Brazil, to Sisi in Egypt, to Netanyahu in Israel, to Trump in the United States, to be able to distinguish between this kind of popular politics and between forms of um, NGO-based uh, advocacy and activism, for example, that's operate operative in languages of human rights and development, very briefly indicated here, from Oxfam to Human Rights Watch and so on. And don't we need to be able to distinguish between this kind of NGO based advocacy and these kinds of popular mobilization from the Rojava revolution to gay activism, to ecology, to the Zapatistas and to the Palestinian led BDS movement against Israeli settler colonialism. Now, arguably to distinguish, to be able to grapple with this kind of popular politics and distinguish between these forms of mobilization is an urgent task in the present, you know, not just for academic reasons, but also because of the ways these forms of politics are operative in the present and they urgently affect the fate of millions of people around the globe, especially uh, disadvantaged subaltern social groups. So what sort of approach to this is useful? Well, my contention here is that Gramscian approaches have a tremendous depth, fertility and range in looking at popular politics. And it's more or less what my research has focused on for the last 15 years in Middle East studies. Um, and I've also looked at kinds of transnational activism as well. So Antonio Gramsci, he was an Italian, he was a communist, he was an intellectual, an activist, he died in 1937. He himself fought fascism. He had significant engagements with both populism and other forms of popular struggle. He died for his cause. He left a vast corpus of writings. And one of the riches of his work is that it's an updating traveling theory with built in possibilities to learn from subsequent movements, anti-colonialism, feminism, queer activism, ecology and anti-racism. It's also a profoundly engaged set of optics. It makes no sense without practice or engagement or, or forms of world changing. So how does Gramsci help in the study of popular politics and different kinds of resistance from below? Well, first of all, he carries on a sharp critique of populism, what he at one point calls merely an adventure, like great leaders or groups who claim to represent but tend to manipulate the masses. It's often something carried on by the wealthy and the well-connected, and it's often dominated by a false spirit of what Gramsci calls subversivism, a kind of empty rejectionism, which treats subordinate groups. And here's the very important part. It treats them as sort of unchanging categories and caricatures. 
as types, as sort of stereotypes, as genus. And this sort of critique we can readily apply to the present in terms of how right-wing populists speak of the subordinated groups that they apparently exalt white men, true patriots, pious women, pure women, while in fact degrading them by treating them as types, as genus, with no way to develop or transform, and also tarring their official enemies, migrants, gay men, Muslims, people of color, and so on, in the same essentialist and caricatured way, treating them as types, naturally united by some dumb generality, be it skin color, genitalia, violent proclivities, and so on. So that's interesting. Second of all, Gramsci carried on a sharp critique of middle classes who sought to absorb and redirect the energies of popular groups to incorporate them in a system controlled by ruling groups. He called that passive revolution. And that sort of idea can act as a powerful critical optic on NGO-based human rights advocacy, which is often highly legalistic, highly professionalized, funded by respectable foundations which can't afford to rock the boat. It's often dominated by middle-class experts. It adopts, it adopts a kind of abstract, falsely universal detached position. And it's been co-opted by various repressive states such as Bahrain or Egypt in the Middle East. And it often works to absorb or redirect the energies of subaltern social groups, crucially removing them from the scene of their own emancipation eliminating any popular or organically intellectual mode whereby popular oppression and liberation can be culturally defined from below, substituting this intellectual work for a kind of pre-given code which has been agreed by states for their own strategic reasons. So human rights advocacy in Gramscian optics is vulnerable to a critique as passive revolution. Third, but Gramsci doesn't then take us on a slide towards sort of postmodern relativism and the repudiation of the real and the political. Instead, his most important task is to develop a sense of the meaning of genuine, a genuine mobilization of popular demands and, and discontents. And that's uh, a hallmark of his work. And he gives us a way to think about how subaltern social groups, from women to slaves to migrants to colonial subjects to workers, could engage in a struggle to transform and overcome their conditions of subordination through an extended struggle involving forms of historical becoming in many molecular phases, as he puts it, to bring about new forms of collective will and alternate forms of hegemony. Gramsci's work in this respect gives us a very powerful optic on how these processes can work and methods for studying this long journey from subordination to revolution. My own research has used Gramsci's concepts of hegemonic common sense and, uh, and, and his more positive uh, concept of good sense. Hegemonic common sense, the sort of broadest conception of the life and world that's often uncritically absorbed and part and parcel of subordination, but good sense being a more sort of positive kernel of popular philosophy, which challenges both abstract intellectualism and hegemonic common sense. And I, I recently, you know, doing e e ethnographic and participatory observation type work, used those ideas to understand revolutionary upsurge and revolutionary weakness in Egypt since the uprisings of 2011. And the basic idea in that research was that good sense operative in the subaltern cultural politics against the corrupt regime was a powerful factor in the uprising in Egypt in 2011 but it was greatly vitiated by a hegemonic common sense, also operative, that trusted the army, the Egyptian armed forces, and that played a role in allowing the Egyptian armed forces to finally come to power above all after 2013 and to impose a highly repressive and authoritarian secular version of right-wing populism. So I think I've, I've run out of time, but uh, on the third question, the yes, I hope this theme can help us uh, create a critical mass around these pressing themes at LSE. There's obviously a lot of synergies uh, between what some of us are doing. And I hope in, in line with what Flora was saying, that it will we can think about ways to connect organically to the kinds of popular self-activity that we see around us, around global justice and, and radical democracy, and, and thereby engage in a process of, of, of learning from uh, activism from below. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, um, for this, yeah, 
very um, important uh, re -ign you know, igniting Gramsci for us here in this theme, which is you know super important. And I think hopefully Amin is going to take up uh, some of this uh, uh, as well in what she says. But for now, I would like to turn to Ellen Helsper, please. Ellen, tell us about your research and digital technologies in relation to these three questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alba. Yeah, um, I think, uh, thank you, first of all, for obviously giving me also the opportunity to talk about my own work beyond setting up the theme. Um, so the below, or as I refer to it really in uh, my work, uh, the everyday um, is uh, really important in the sense of that um, it is where inequalities are experienced and where uh, they influence people's norms and values and opportunities. And uh, in our everyday lives right now, the below is increasingly if not for many people at the moment of uh, that we're speaking of right now, digital is where technologies are accessed and where they're used. Yeah, it's not at the level of society or the economy where we engage with digital technologies, but in our everyday lives, it's where we interact and we communicate with others. So online, it's not just our relationships, but we are constantly bombarded with images and information and interactions that shape our worldviews and these are also the spaces in which we can shape the views of others and organize ourselves or in which our small everyday actions can have an impact on others and the way society is shaped. So our experience and our ability and our willingness to recognize and therefore to counter inequalities, these are shaped by the people around us and these physical or digital spaces that we inhabit and these other people inhabit. So for me, the below is really where kind of the everyday is where structural inequalities play out, but also the only place in which real resistance, uh, resistance and change can take place. Um, unless people in their everyday lives and in their interactions start finding inequalities they encounter unjust or unacceptable, nothing will change at the structural level. And for me, that kind of points also a little bit to my theoretical approach in the sense is that I, I really look at kind of incorporate theories, theories of uh, relative uh, deprivation or exclusion, where it's that our everyday context that shape our ability to, and our willingness to resist inequalities. And that everyday is digital. So as I said, my approach is one which looks at how inequalities are reproduced and contested as societies become increasingly digital. Theoretically, it separates different domains in everyday life. So it doesn't take inequalities as one thing, but looks at many different types of inequality. And it does not assume that if replication takes place in one domain, let's say the economic one, it also takes place in another domain, let's say, let's say the cultural or social sphere. So, in my research that looks at the links between social and digital inequalities, we find evidence for the replication of inequalities along historical lines of disadvantage, but that this often is restricted to specific domains and it's not universal. So where people have digital resources in everyday life, they tend to actually use access to these technologies and their skills to use these technologies to further those things that are particularly important for them. So in the domain-based approach, somebody might kind of notice the inspiration of Bourdieu thinking about reproduction of inequality in our everyday actions and values um, in capitals, but also the hints of uh, Amartya Sen's approach uh, to uh, looking at contestation by the creation of equal opportunities. And technologies in this sense are often talked about as the site for equal opportunities. Um, focus empirically on exceptions to the rule since we've mostly find reproduction of inequalities as societies become increasingly digital. So I asked the question, what is it that explains how certain individuals or group who we might expect to be excluded based on historical patterns of inequalities? Why is it that those uh, certain individuals or certain groups are able to counter these in digital, uh, digital worlds and digital platforms? For example, who has digital skills, engages extensively, and has positive outcomes of the use of these technologies against these historical odds of disadvantage. I focus thereby not so much on broad social and sociological categorizations, this essentialism that John also talked about, but I look at how the ecologies in which we live, yeah, the places that make up our physical environments, but also our digital environments and the people in them, um, how um, and how the how these uh, shift the way we might be willing to and able to resist these inequalities. 
My take of this is inspired by an intersectional approach, such as that come up proposed by Crenshaw and others, which argues that how inequalities are experienced and accepted and resisted is the result of the coming together of um, the kind of environments, the specific environments, the neighborhoods in which we live, um, the people that we know, where we work, how these environments are shaped. And in combination with like, many of our identity characteristics that shape um, our resistance and willingness and ability to resist inequality. So um, to, to finish, um, uh, kind of, I would like to talk about what I think about this theme and why it's so important. I think it's unique in how it foregrounds theories of change as opposed to mere descriptions of the existence and perpetuation of inequalities, which is a tendency often find in my field of uh, digital inequalities, where there's a lot of description about who pe how people who are traditionally disadvantaged are also disadvantaged or even further disadvantaged in digital worlds. Yeah. Um, so I think the theme impl implicitly argues against the abdication also of responsibilities uh, to leaders or to armchair criticism and puts the ball back in all our courts. As I argue in the book, The Digital Disconnect, that's about to be published, the digital worlds, uh, in the digital worlds, all our everyday actions, from the liking of a post or uh, one post, another, another post, from the clicking on a certain uh, news item and not on another item, from the uploading of a video about one thing and not something else, that all these everyday actions have consequences for what, what people who enter the digital world after us will see and experience and how they, what they think is just or unjust in the world. Therefore, all our everyday actions, in digital societies are opportunities for resistance to inequalities and injustice. And this is what makes that theme so special, this theme so special to me and why I am so excited in uh, participating in it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much. And also for highlighting why theories of social change are so important in, in, in for us to look at, not just the reproduction and perpetuation of, uh, of inequality. And of course, that was exactly what John was talking about. Uh, and it's something that I'd like to ask all of you more about. Uh, what, what are your theoretical inspirations? But we will um, come back to that perhaps. For now, I want to um, uh, invite Armin to give us her reflections on the three questions. Over to you, Armin. Thank you so much, Alpa. So why should we focus on resistance from below? I would argue that a focus on resistance from below really allows us to consider how individuals and communities are not only affected by inequalities, but how they exercise their agency to resist, contest, subvert, and offer alternatives to the status quo by engaging in a range of actions and rejecting the existing cultural models and taken for granted assumptions by questioning the existing hierarchies and the current ways of doing things. I'm particularly interested, as my colleague Flora was mentioning, in prefigurative forms of action, which are about being the change you want to see in the world, and where even failure in terms of impact is not so important because you are creating other forms of social relations and care. In terms of my theoretical approach to studying um, social movements, mobilization, and all the other forms of civil society action, I focus on three interconnected questions. I ask why do people mobilize, how they mobilize, and what factors shape and influence their ability to achieve their aims. Working in a social policy department, however, I'm not simply limited to looking at the policy level in terms of impact, but considering changes at the cultural, symbolic, and wider political levels. I've done research in a number of countries, including Armenia, Greece, England, Egypt, and Russia. I've looked at anti-austerity movements, movements for democracy, and solidarity movements in the context of humanitarianism. And throughout my work, I bring together new social movement theories of collective identity and agency, together with theories of power, governance, and governmentality, which are central to the study of the politics of policy. In a bid to understand the connections between mobilization resistance and the wider social, political and policy transformations. An element is of my work is to engage and to bring a clearer focus on social movements 
thinking about how they engage, inform, and shape social policy, which to date has received little attention in social policy as a discipline. And asking why people protest or mobilize, we cannot assume that progressive politics and collective action magically emerge from aggrieved identities or discontent. So we need to consider the ideational motivations, experiences and perceptions of injustice, social identities, as well as emotions and subjectivities, and how they create and allow for collective mobilization and action. Moving away from the functionalist and instrumentalist approaches, we need to consider meanings, identity, and culture, and how these inform and produce collective action. In terms of looking at how people mobilize, I look at a range of actors. I take on board John's criticism of NGOs, but in my work, in terms of looking at collective action and mobilization, I look at how social movements and activists and grassroots groups engage with local and international NGOs to examine and explore spaces of rupture, points of collaboration, but also where conflict emerges, and to consider how these groups intersect, but also diverge in their bid to influence the institutions and structures of power. Given my focus on examining the impacts, not necessarily the impacts, but the ways in which mobilization influences the wider politics and also institutions of power. On the one hand, I consider how through governance mechanisms, states and other institutions seek to discipline, silence and co-opt movements and activists and grassroots groups. But on the other hand, how these actors resist, adapt and circumvent those limitations and restrictions. I'll share a slide here. As you can see, in recent years, we have seen more and more countries adopting regulation, legislation, and criminalizing different forms of civil society action. Not only are countries taking steps to limit protests and rallies, but also the advocacy and campaigning activities of NGOs. And yet, despite this closing of space, the number of protests across the globe have continued to grow, even during the pandemic, as a recent global survey by the Carnegie Endowment dem demonstrates. So the numbers are growing despite the both physical and political closing of spaces. Despite the growing number of protests, however, critics continue to question the consequences of collective action, arguing while there is, quote unquote, a lot of grumbling and dissatisfaction, movements and collective action is, to their mind, inconsequential in that it is unable to achieve structural or policy impact. I find these arguments to be very limited. Their focus on impact and outcomes as very instrumentalist and reductive and very narrowly focused on the long on the short term. I would argue that we need to consider how movements are not only arenas, but as Gramsci would argue, battlefields for an emancipatory politics, which creates spaces for radical imagination and transformation over longer periods of time. In drawing to a close, I want to add a cautionary note, and that is that we should also approach movements with a critical gaze in the sense that movements themselves are also spaces where power flows. And if we're bringing an intersectional approach to the study of movements and mobilizations, we need to consider how hierarchies and exclusions emerge and persist within organizational spaces of movements, how there is a marginalization of certain voices depending on identity. For these reasons, an intersectional approach allows us to consider how inequalities are challenged, but also play out and reproduce, are reproduced in movements. Moving forward, I think there's an enormous interest and potential in this themes area of research. I think empirically and theoretically, we can continue to examine and find new things in terms of looking at the processes and dynamics of mobilization, resistance, and everyday forms of action. Moreover, I would argue that we should not just limit ourselves to studying progressive forms of action, but also consider the emergence of right wing and regressive movements and the counter movement movement dynamics that emerge. 
drawing to a close, I would say that in terms of this theme, another important element is that its connection to the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program. I believe this gives us a very unique opportunity to bring together in a meaningful way, rigorous, theoretically informed work with participatory action research that genuinely engages with, learns from, and speaks with activists, organizers, and communities to, to create new forms of knowledge. I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Armin, uh, for that wonderful um, uh, introduction to reminding us of right wing movements as well as more progressive movements and the need to st study all together of bringing intersectionality approaches to the core of what we research, the divisions within movements. All of these are important themes. I want to open um, the, the session now to a wider discussion that emerges and is inspired by these wonderful presentations that we've had. We already have a lot of questions um, being raised by the audience. Thank you. Um, uh, for for raising them just use the Q&A functions uh, on on your on your zoom screens to ask your questions uh, I can see that there is actually um, several um, uh, questions which actually complement each other uh, 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 and uh, I would actually like to uh, combine some of them into one big question which is also a question that is all that, has, that kind of haunts me in a way um, uh, and that is the question of um, you know what is our role uh, in in, um, in 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 the university uh, uh, in relation to the struggles on the ground? I, I'm I, I want to just uh, draw attention to these the questions around this, which have been raised by Gabriela Cabana, an anthropology PhD student at the LSE, who is saying who is asking, how do you plan to put your research at the service of the struggles you investigate? Uh, Gabriela, I know you have another question, but I will I will raise that at another point. Uh, I also want to highlight Duncan Exley's um, uh, contribution, who's, you know, he's worked as a campaigner activist for 20 years. Um, and he's, he's, he's asking about um, how, you know, the grassroots, how, how privileged platforms amplify or give plat give a platform to uh, grassroots voices uh, that may not actually be representative of those struggles, but that may represent more the privileged person's own values and interests or assumptions so how do we you know how do we he's asking that in relation to NGOs or journalists or activists who join movements but also it applies to us as university researchers you know how um, you know what's our role uh, in relation to struggles uh, on, on, on the ground uh, this is also a concern that's been raised by um, Nihari um, is it Nihari Pandit I'm looking for your Niharika Pandit, what's the place of, you know, the elite university, the place of political organizing in elite universities, the relationship between theory and praxis. Niharika, thank you. You're from uh, LSE, LSE Gender. Uh, Helena, Robert, um, uh, you also have, uh, have, have a question uh, uh, in relation to this. So, um, yeah, uh, one of your questions. Um, basically asking us, uh, um, uh, you know, again, about our role as res researchers in, in, in Western institutions. How do you how do you approach the subject of resistance from your positionality? So I think there's a, these are a series of number of questions which are all addressing, you know, how you all see your roles uh, in relation to struggles, struggles which are, as you have pointed out, are mean sometimes divided themselves, uh, struggles which, uh, you know, have have gender inequalities, have racial inequalities within them? Uh, do we just join forces, join arms with the struggles on the grounds? What's our role as researchers? What are our responsibilities? How are we going to contribute back to those struggles? And I'm asking, I think these questions are really important because they really haunted me in my work on, on you know, India's um, Naxalite movement where, where, you know, what is that, you know, do you as an activist, uh, as an academic activist, step inside those movements and be an ambassador for those movements or do you you know 
maintain your critical eye and your critical position because in fact those movements on the ground also need that they need that criticism a criticism from within uh, a self-criticism um you know what's our role uh as Mao would have said you know um what is our what is our what is our um you know what is our role uh, in the in these elite institutions and how are you dealing with this in your work what do you see the place of this theme in in dealing with this tricky dirty murky messy uh difficult question over to you guys who would like to go first flora <laughs> i'll pick on one of you sorry <laughs> um i can i'll respond in me just sort of firstly to i think duncan's point about um you're giving a platform to certain representatives and not others and I, I would just, I, I agree that's a big challenge. And I kind of, for me, underlines the importance of doing our homework. And we've, I think most of us have talked about um, our work. We try to engage in depth in praxis. So we need to know, we need to know the, you know, the ins and outs. And as Armina says, the, you know, the conflicts, the problems, the flaws in the movements we study and work with. Um, we need to know the terrain and, and, you know, the positions of different possible representatives. So we can't just sort of, um, it, it's not easy. It's a lot of hard work. You've got to put, you know, you've got to like put in the, in the, in the work. Um, so I'm just kind of acknowledging it, it's a real problem and it's, it's work, you know, it's good, you know, it's, it's hard work and it's tricky. So that's my response. That was a little response to Duncan's point. I'll let somebody else take up the, I mean, or I could. Yeah. Sumi, if, can, I, can I invite you? You need to unmute yourself, Sumi. Uh, thank you. Arthur. I mean, these are such super important questions. And these are questions that, um, you know, as, as you were saying, Arpa, one is constantly sort of uh, you know, uh, engage, I mean, constantly dealing with them, right? Because these are also in some ways unresolvable tensions, right? I mean, this is not sort of saying that, okay, you know, here's the sort of, you know, here's the, um, uh, you know, here's the mantra to do this, or here's the formula and you'll be fine, right? I mean, it isn't quite like that. And I think the question of struggle is absolutely key to this. Right. The question of struggle, the question of reflexivity, uh, attentiveness to intersectional and intersecting, interlocking oppressions. Right. And, and, and all of those things are, are extremely important. The reflexivity, of course, I come back to it because that question of reflexivity and hyper reflexivity, always thinking about what is the role of the researcher in all of this, as you pointed out, you know, Alba, what do you do, right? I mean, and, and, and for me, for many years, it has been what is knowledge for, right? And I have, and, and dad for me, and dad has enabled me to design the courses I do, I design the, the, the teaching that I do, uh, and so on. And that enables one to think about what is what is one's role in the knowledge that one is producing, but also in the classroom, right? So as teachers, we are, you know, that is a, a very key and important role about thinking about the knowledges that we are transmitting, not only producing, but also transmitting, right? And so that question about what is knowledge for, it's clearly not disinterested <laughs> knowledge, right? I think we should just get rid of anything, anything that panel today has shown that, you know, that is not even on the table. And, 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 and then producing knowledge that is able to support those at the forefront of global injustice and inequality. I mean, I've, I've seen my work as, as, as somewhere there. And, and very much sort of interested in that. But at the same time, I think it's very important, and this has been brought out by some questions and, uh, and so on, and, and also um, um, mentioned earlier uh, by the speakers that it's so important not to romanticize, <laughs> not to romanticize these, right, right? Abu Lugod, or Leila Abu Lugod, anthropologist, anthropologist is a wonderful case for, you know, uh, how not to romanticize resistance, right? So you cannot, and, and I think that's where paying attention to intersectional conflicts, of course, gender itself is a political concept. So which means that 
uh, you know, uh, talking about gender brings to fore conf conflicts straight away, right? So intersectional gender conflicts are all, you're always mired in a politics of struggle and a politics of conflict. And it's as ever, it's about that negotiation without, without letting go of one's own reflexivity, one's own location, but also that question of what one's responsibility is uh, as an educator, as a researcher, as a teacher. Thank you, Sumi. Um I'd like to invite both the theme leaders, uh, Ellen and Armin, to reflect on, you know, on this question of what is our role? What is our role? How do we deal with this, this uh, the difficulties of an activist uh, engagement in a university context? What is our role as university researchers? Why not just go and join those movements? You know, why? What are we doing in the university? I mean, why, why do we need, why do we need, do we need us? I mean, we don't, surely. <laughs> Or, or do we, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Alpha. Um, I, I, I'll go first, Ellen, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think there's, you know, I don't want to repeat what Suma and, uh, Sumi and Flora said, I think really important points about maintaining the criticality, not being overly romantic and, you know, thinking around how do you also do participatory kinds of research and collaborative research whilst maintaining your independence and voice as a scholar, because I think in some ways there is, you know, oh, should I be writing this? How will it impact the movement? How will it impact this mobilization, which sometimes pulls me back in terms of maybe self-censoring myself and not saying what I really think and making those critical remarks. But I think we need to have the, the courage to do that. I'm in a unique position um, and very fortunate position to be not just a researcher, but also working with the Atlantic Fellows. And I think that has really pushed me in terms of thinking around these questions of what is knowledge for, who creates that knowledge, how do we use that knowledge and who can challenge that? So I think part of it is to be open to those critiques from you know, practitioners from the activists and not assuming that we are the be all and end all, you know, in terms of knowledge creation and production. But it is very difficult because you have to kind of open up yourself and be a bit thick skinned to, to take that. Thank, Thank you, you. Armin. Yeah, so I think I have a slightly unique position in this uh, in this panel in the sense that I don't study movements. <laughs> I, I study uh, everyday actions and small actions that we all do in everyday lives. And so for me, I'm I'm uh, I'm have a very privileged position in the sense of everyday action. So I think, you know, my research is a con continuous education of myself on realizing my own privilege and the privilege of the students and the privilege of the the actors that I have access to through my work at the LSE, because through the work at the LSE and the kind of research that we do, I engage with policymakers all over the world with, uh, you know, uh, the, the the kind of big organizations um, that we're not talking about at this moment. And um, so I think um, for me, kind of the value of the work that I do is that it can serve as a certain bridge to make people aware of how the actions of organizations are limiting the possibilities of everyday action, everyday people to resist inequalities and how, how the societies and the structures we create are not just perpetuating inequalities, but make it easier for some people to be heard or to, be, uh, to get the opportunity to, to uh, contest um, inequalities that they see unjust. But because I think there's a, still a lot of a lack of awareness uh, of how this actually takes place at the everyday level in our everyday actions and in, the, in my work in the digital space where our use of and how we use technologies actually makes it easier for some people and not for other people to participate and to resist. So I think for me, uh, the position of privilege both makes me humble in the sense of that I realize that all the experience of the people around me that I see and that I work with and that I engage with are completely different from uh, the experiences uh, that other people have on digital platforms or in digital societies. And so I think um, just awareness creation and pointing out that all of us are collectively responsible and we cannot leave it to movements to change society. Yeah, that all of us are responsible for creating these opportunities for people who, um, who might have less privileged positions or who are oppressed to be heard and not just to be heard, but to be listened to as well in the sense of that we follow up and that it's our responsibility to make that happen. And uh, so I think for me, that is the really important role and that 
that I can use the resources that I have to make people aware, to keep bringing that, to keep knocking on doors saying like, are you aware that this is going on? Is this the society that you want to live in? What is the society that we can all agree on is more just and how can we make that happen through our everyday actions? Not through big things, but through everyday actions. And I think that is, um, yeah, that is a position that, you know, and as Armin already said, LSE has a very unique position in that it has that, kind of bridging, networking role of bringing people together who might otherwise never sit at the same table or never be heard by uh, the people in power and will privilege. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. John, I've left the last word to you because I know this is something that you've given a lot of thought to. Uh, would you Would you like oh. to speak this up? Oh, well, I, actually, you know, I, 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 I well, I, no simple formula, but yeah, no, an academic is, is in a very different position to, um, you know, like we, we know that Gramsci himself, he dropped out of university when he was an undergraduate, right? Uh, so, um, so for me, just, I'm not an expert on this topic. Mine, I, a, a process of unlearning of my own hegemonic position, you know, which is, which takes a lot of boxes about, you know, whiteness, maleness. Uh, Britishness, etc. So there's a, a huge amount of unlearning, which is very sort of painful and long. But then there's a, a process of learning from popular struggles. Uh, and then there's, a, for me, a process of sort of engagements here and there. I, I've been an activist in the, in the, in the Palestinian BDS movement. I've been, an, I've, be, I've been engaged with the Giulio Reggiani a case, the, the scholar, our colleague who was murdered by the Egyptian government in 2016. I've been engaged in sort of expert witnessing in court cases. I, you know, so a lot of that's been me, you know, making mistakes and then learning a bit and sometimes trying to put expertise in here and there, learning, you know, it's that sort of thing from where, where my, my, but I'm just aware there's loads of questions in the chat and I don't want to spend too much time on, on positionality. Thank you, John. Thank you. Though I think it is very important that this theme addresses mm. these issues sure. uh, and to start off with. Um, we, we've actually managed to, I think, address a number of questions through, through your responses already, but there's one issue which I think is uh, coming, coming, c coming through in a number of the um, contributions from um, uh, Gabriela Cabana, from uh, Anuprita Shukla, I think. Um, uh, who, who are actually inspired, I think, maybe by Flora's presentation um, uh, and are asking about whether we should start thinking about resistance as kind of a global economies of care, whether, how does care feature in, in your thoughts? And because one of the things we're hoping to do on these research themes is also build synergies between the themes. And since I am one of the conveners of the, of the global economies of care theme, I wanted to ask you to think uh, about this uh, about this question, um, which is actually, a, in some ways, a, a different kind of approach to resistance than I understand a Gramscian approach to be, uh, thinking about the spaces which is which is created just within the movement, um, uh, the solidarities of care that are being 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 formed. So um, I'm wondering. I I'd just like to open open uh, that issue to, to all of you uh, thinking on your feet about um, how care might feature or, or might not uh, in, in, your, in your work. Um, but um, I, I want to combine that with another question, uh, which I hope will help us highlight your, your approaches and which is whether you could tell us about, you know, your, your kind of main theoretical influences uh, in, 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 in your work. So, uh, you know, people who have inspired your approach that you know we might take uh, forward. Of course, that's been very clear in John's presentation, uh, but maybe uh, with with some of the rest of you, it would be really great to to, ha to have you think that one through. So yeah, over over to you uh, again. I'll, I'll start off with Flora again because I know she'll have a she'll have she'll have a ready response to this question, uh, and so that to give the others a, a bit of a chance to gather their thoughts. Flora. Thank you. Um, I think sometimes when we think of the term care, we think of quite small scale, you know, um, child care or elder care, social care, you know, people looking after each other, you know, people looking after other vulnerable people. Um, and we think of politics as being big, grand, 
um, possibly antagonistic, dramatic, etc. sort of phenomena. And I think one of the things that I have sort of been rethinking in my work in the sort of post Grenfell space is that in campaigns and protests and so on, there is also a lot there, there is care. And so one of the examples in, in, in the after Grenfell space, um, bereaved and survivors have been campaigning to have the cladding, which is the panels on the outside of the building that were responsible for the um, disaster. Um, that type of cladding is on many other residential buildings across Britain, and there has been a big campaign to have them removed. And it's been tortuous, the sort of steps, you know, tiny steps forward. Um, and I think what I'm trying to, one of the things I'm trying to say is that, um, and, and they keep on going, right? That's what I was trying to say in my sort of little um, talk earlier. Even when they get a setback, um, they all keep on going. And that in insisting on this, that this is worth fighting for, they are demonstrating care for other people in other tower blocks um, and, and other blocks with the same sort of cladding. They are insisting that it is worth, you know, this caring for each other is the way we do things, right? They're sort of, they're insisting on that. As you said, um, Alpha, that's a, sort of a um, prefigurative politics kind of, um, um, but it's a little different, I think, to the usual way of thinking about prefigurative politics. So that, you know, movements not only have these demands that they're trying to make, but in struggling for that demand, you're saying, this is not okay. We need, we need, you know, we need, we, we believe in a more just world and in a more caring world. That's, shall I stop there on care? Yes, thank yeah. you. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, what, 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 what did you want to tell us about your theoretical inspirations? You mentioned Donna Haraway in your presentation. I'll just say briefly, you know, I, I, I sort of call myself a community psychologist. And in this field, sort of um, the work of Paolo Freire has been foundational you know, and a sort of, you know, with sort of Marxist view of um, oppressed people coming to understand the structural sources of their oppression and um, developing a theory of change and a, you know, way to work together to get there. That was sort of where I came from. And I just, which is, and there's, you know, important stuff in that, which is, you know, rooted throughout all my thinking, but it's sort of this kind of linear goal directed way of thinking. Um, and so that's um, more recently I've been, um, yes, drawing on Donna Haraway, um, but also other, um, um, other sort of more contemporary um, and also black feminist approaches that don't necessarily think in that sort of linear goal way and um, also value the action as a sort of caring and valuable in itself, simultaneous with all of the, um, with the um, uh, disappointments, um, setbacks and so on. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sumi, um, what about you? I mean, Paulo Freire seems to be doing in, in some ways what you know you, you set out in your concepts from, from below. Um, to, you know, where do you, yeah, tell us, tell us your theoretical inspirations and, and also whether you have any reflections on the economies of care and whether they play out in, your, in the way you approach um, resistance from below, politics from below. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Actually, I wouldn't, I think I probably need you to keep doing that for me because I keep forgetting, don't I? I'm just, oh my goodness me. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, I was just saying that very difficult questions and super important ones, you know, I'm always sort of worried about coming very quickly and appearing glib because one can do that, right? In a, in a, in a mode of sort of very quick engagement. But I do think that uh, engage one must uh, because they're so important. Um, so, uh, care, global economies of care, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and so I have, uh, in addition to all the important things that have been said about it and, and people who work on it very particularly and specifically, uh, of course, and, and lots of um, feminist uh, economists um, uh, and, and people whose work I admire very much have done so much to bring in questions of social reproduction and, and, and so on to the forefront. Um, and I think that one of the things that I 
think of in terms of when I'm thinking in terms of global economies of care is in terms of how to think about ethical care, right? Eth exercising ethical care in our own uh, intellectual work and teaching and how that might then interrupt that juggernaut of neoliberalism and that expectation of neoliberal sort of functioning and way of being in the world and for which always expects one to perform for the market, right? So how does that then shift that epistemic perspective from functioning and performing as a robot for the market all of the time Right, uh, and 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 the kind of world and that just and the kind of ethicality that comes into uh, view when one does that. About um, so I'll stop because I said you know that this is this is uh, you know a lot of uh, my uh, people who are, work I admire feminist economists and political economists are do, doing this work and so I'm just a little bit of a sort of you know outlier in the field uh, in terms of but this is how I, I think about that question of economies of care. Um, in terms of who are my intellectual um, heroes, uh, I love talking about my intellectual heroes, but you know, in some ways, uh, one is so connected, right, through the lineages that one inherits. And, you know, so there's so many tracks and so many ways that one, and some ways such a privilege, and I've spoken about it when I speak about a feminist debt uh, to, to the work that has gone, right? That acknowledgement of that debt that makes it possible to think of particular kinds of knowledges in the first place. And there's so many anti-colonial thinkers from Fanon, uh, you know, and always so anti-colonial, uh, you know, um, uh, thinkers, uh, anti-racial uh, thought. Uh, I mean, there's so much of it that I, uh, I feel like, and there's always a problem with list making because you always end up being exclusionary. You always leave out people. And so I'm always a bit concerned about that. But I would simply say that my uh, thinking has been coming from, you know, a very, you know positions of um, Marxist inspired, uh, thinking, uh, going on to socialist feminist uh, work, anti-colonial, anti-racial black feminist, and of course my immense debt to the work that people have done on the politics of location, which have made it possible for somebody like me working in the global south, working, you know, to imagine epistemic spaces, right, which global south spaces have never historically been seen as epistemic spaces, right, that, that's a classic argument that Edward Said makes. So uh, I would leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, Ellen. Ellen first, perhaps. Okay. I go first this time. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think I already mentioned in my presentation a little bit that the, the kind of frameworks, so the Bourguignon framework, which separates different domains in everyday life um, and sends approaches to equality of opportunity, although I also have a critique of that approach. But these are really important for me in a sense of that they, they kind of really allow us to shift away from a purely economic based interpretation of what is uh, what is considered uh, valuable in everyday life. And I think in the discussion of inequality, we often focus on economic inequalities, but actually you know, this is also the great thing about this theme is that it's really, really puts the emphasis back on other types of inequalities, participatory inequalities in many ways, but also inequalities of inequalities of care and, you know, the devaluing of other aspects that are not just a neoliberal market economy based um, values. And in, in my work, I work currently on two big projects so from digital skills, the tangible outcomes project. Uh, which is kind of an umbrella term for many different projects and the youth skills project and both of these projects have a real emphasis on outcomes that are not economic but they're saying we need to value what is important in everyday life what is important from for the people at the below is often actually the the things that makes us feel good as citizens as, uh, you know val feel valued are these other aspects of our lives and so when we look at the digital space that I research, this is often, it very often understudied, very often undervalued. It's digital skills and access I talked about in terms of how they give us access to jobs and how they give us access, instead of focusing on how they allow us to connect to others, to create collectives, to creating a sense of uh, participation and well being in, in broader society. So, so those I think are really important. I, as others, I don't want to list because it will be a never ending list in terms of inspiration. So, but for me, kind of as a general grouping of, of theorists that have been really important for me is those that focus on place-based, context-based approaches to understanding why 
why people are able to resist or see inequalities un as unjust. And so, you know, there's people, I mentioned Crenshaw and Waldi in an intersectional approach, but also people like Samson and Limaggio who really look at how the very local environments in which we live influence us to feel empowered, to make a change or to feel empowered for us to see how our everyday actions contribute to an equal society and might therefore also motivate us to, to change our own behaviors and our norms and our values. So I think that there's many others um, and uh, yeah, listing is not, uh, not, Thanks, not productive. Um, Thanks, I mean, one, only one theorist, please. Oh gosh, okay, then I guess it's Gramsci. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Gramscian understanding to civil society and thinking about ideas of you know, hegemonic and counter hegemonic. I do want to also just mention, you know, the work on solidarity and kind of thinking around bio inequalities of whose lives are valued in spaces of, you know, of, of, of crisis. And um, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go too long, but I think, you know, those the work of people like Didier Fassin, by Achille Membe and others draw attention, Tanya Marie Lee, to these, you know, calculations that take place and the ways in which solidarity actors question that dehumanization and depoliticization and draw attention to kind of the value of each life rather than thinking about it, as Agamemnon says, you know, in terms of bare life of just survival. I'll stop there. Thank you. I mean, John, I'm not going to ask you about your theoretical inspiration. Mm. But I do want to ask you about care. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, has, yeah. You, has Flora's presentation got you thinking in new ways about care yeah. in, your, in your work? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's funny. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. I, I was, um, it seems, to, I, I really like the, the, the way it appears in, in Flora's research from what I've heard so far. And, uh, and I thought that is very interesting. And it did get me thinking. I mean, of course, uh, you know, I also think of the, there's the sort of Foucauldian care of the self. And, uh, and, and, and that's also very interesting, that kind of. And there's, you know, one thinks of all the things that, that, that it can work against, like left sectarianism, it, you know, for, as, a, as a good thing. It can work against masculinism. It can work with certain kinds of feminist sensibilities. It can work around uh, also queer sensibilities too. So there's lots of reasons, I think, to be interested in, in care. There is this research coming out of Egypt now, you know, this extraordinarily, I mean, people are very hesitant to use the word trauma, but around what happened between 2011 and 2013 and where it left people, you know, from these high moments of transformative activity to this appalling despair of, of, of torture and, and killing, you know, in, in Egypt. And so care, uh, yeah, something that's, that resonates with those. those. Um, but, you know, I, I also, I just read something on um, sort of horizontalism in Tunisia. And, and my impression in that research was that it was trying to substitute the idea of care for the idea of a more expanded transformative politics. And when that happens, it can be a problem. But, 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 but uh, you know, so so different things, but I wonder, just speculating, I wonder if it's a part of a sort of a good sense in a Gramscian way. It's a kind of a good sense that we care, that, that you know, there are forms of caring uh, that are crucial to solidarity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's so um, thought provoking, uh, fascinating, actually. How do we make care into common sense rather than good sense? Hey, um, so I want to. So there's a number. So, so to the to the to the people who are listening, the audience, as you will see, I've been drawing aspects of your questions and, and, and grouping them into, an, you know, into larger questions. And I want to end. Uh, so, as you know, I'm, I'm not directly asked every single question that you've raised. I'm sorry, there's just far too many questions to do that um but uh, i hope to uh, that we can you know interact generate a more interesting conversation and let the panel speak to each other through through this through through, through this process of grouping questions together so uh, on that note i want to actually end with one last um question uh and this is to take into account that um uh, one last question to all the panelists for which they have one minute each uh and um this is the, and i'd like to ask this question um with them taking into account some of the issues that have been raised by our audience then 
the need to think uh, about uh, various aspects of, of movements. Um, so let me ask the question first, and then I, let me tell you about the things I'd like, like to take you into like you to take into account, uh, which has been raised in the audience. So the question I want to ask you is, if we've now talked about theoretical inspirations, I want to ask you about what kind of grassroots movements, movements from below, um, name one uh, that inspires you right now uh, and give me a reason or a couple of reasons. And, and I want you to bear into account that the, our audience has raised various different issues. Uh, there's been a question on leadership. What is the role of leadership? They've raised the question of religion. What is the role of religion? They've raised the question of racism, of social class, of gender and, and of, of gender inequalities. So a whole range of issues have been have been um, raised. And thinking about all of these issues that have been raised by our audience, please, um, uh, yeah, tell us about what is your inspiration. What are your what? Where do you find inspirations when when thinking about a politics? from below that challenges inequality which movements uh, do you find inspiration in but yeah try and limit it to one uh, okay over to who let's start with Armin and Ellen uh, the, the theme conveners Armin so one movement that's really inspiring me is the anti-mining movement um, on the Amulsar mine in Armenia I know that's very specific but why I chose that movement is because it is uh, bringing together young women and young men from the capital together with the villagers who live around the mine, challenging our perceptions about rural urban kind of identities. The young women in particular who are involved are fearless, which again challenges the gender norms in Armenia. They're putting the issue in such a way, taking it out of kind of the very local politics and putting it at the level of global politics to talk about how this is a neoliberal extractivist policy driven by the government who is too afraid to challenge and to speak out. And they've been there, you know, for years now and they've managed to stop the mine. So um, the Amulsar Defenders are my movement. I'm gonna go and look them up immediately. Thank you <laughs> for that. Ellen, please. So again, I uh, I think I'll stick instead of sticking to movement, it's to inspiring uh, uh, locations because in the end uh, I, I focus on inspiring spaces. So um, I think one of my most inspiring um, hope giving experiences was uh, in uh, in two neighborhoods. One in 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 Watts in. Um, in Los Angeles, and uh, one is in, uh, in in Santiago, in in Chile, where we've done a research, where uh, we saw uh, young people who, in digital spaces, who came from relative uh, like relatively deprived or uh, disenfranchised um, backgrounds and neighborhoods, but had uh, a, a contacts and and connections with people outside of that, to uh, to take those experiences and to make people engage with their experiences, to see that there was another way in which life was lived and to inspire therefore also resistance in groups that might have not have otherwise been confronted with those. So those individuals for me have been inspiring to see how they, you know, with their community have been able to raise awareness and, and make change. Thank you, Ellen. We have three minutes left and we have three more speakers. So a minute each. John, over to you. Oh, just a quick one, just from a, it was, um, it was something that someone called Yara Hawari spoke about. She just uh, last week, couple of weeks ago, and she just recalled at this terrible moment on, on the Palestine file, this moment when in sort of March 2011, partly in response to the Arab uprisings, uh, some Palestinians tried to just, uh, who were in, living in refugee camps and have been for the longest time in Lebanon and Syria, they just tried to walk back into, into Palestine. And, and, they di and they did so. And, and it was just this, ex she brought it up as a sort of a memory, a kind of inventory of traces of a moment of sort of hope. And it, it did involve this, a lot of embracing and weeping and they, they couldn't believe they could just walk across this border just for one moment they could before the Israeli security forces arrived, started shooting them. And, um, but, but there was just this moment of astonishing feeling that a border had been crossed. And then, and then of course the borders came down again, but there was, she was, it was a, a sort of remembering such a thing. Uh, yeah, it was, it was inspiring. I mean, of course there are, there are so many of these, it's invidious to choose one, but you know, that was just a moment of inspiration that occurred to, you know, a couple of weeks ago. That, that, mm. Thank you. Thank you, John. Lots to think about there, just in one, one process of movement across borders. Thank you, Sumi. Uh, 
Um, so I'm, I look at so many different movements and, but they are, they are sort of come under the umbrella of the right to food movement in India, which is, uh, which is an umbrella group of so many different uh, subaltern mobilizations and also the Andaman Mazarin in Pakistan. And so I've been looking at these movements and I, what I find I'm so, uh, so inspiring and, and, and sort of so fantastic in removing any vestiges of uh, academic inspired cynicism, right? That that comes in and the despair and the, and the sort of difficulties that it is when you're there and, and I'm just awestruck. I mean, completely inspired by the courage of these super marginalized uh, women particularly a women who are living that everydayness, right? So it's not sort of people, you know, observing them and then going and writing about them and so on. They're actually living it. And to live in that context of, of conflict with all the stakes and struggles, right? Knowing in and out, there is no out. It's not like the sort of feminist researcher coming in for a few months and then leaving and then coming in. It's not like that, there is no out. And, and that level of commitment is just absolutely awe-inspiring and keeps me going. And, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, bringing us to that focus on commitment, that ongoing, you know, the sincerity, the kind of things that Flora actually brought up in her presentation. So Flora, over to you. It's exactly the same kind of thing as Sumi and John have talked about. Um, still in the Grenfell context, um, residents, of in Henry Dickens estate in the day after the fire. Um, the local community center was locked. Donations were piling up on the streets and something needed to be done. They called the landlord, wouldn't help with the keys and a group of, you know, a couple of residents just broke the lock, went in, started sorting things out. They're still there three and a half years later with a whole program of activities for children and young people and for the adults on the estate. And they, it was that just as some, John's um, um, example reminded me of that. It was that moment of we just have to do it. And they just did it. And it has led to um, lots of great things. Wow, thank you. Thank you for, for leaving us on those inspiring thoughts and movements from the ground. Um, uh, before we close, I'd just like to say um, four thanks to everybody. Uh, first, to all the people behind the scenes who are hosting this event. Thank you all for being there, the people that you can't see uh, in the audience. Secondly, thanks to the audience for being absolutely amazing, um, for giving us great questions to think through. Um, thirdly, to our wonderful panelists who've been, um, yeah, so inspiring and, 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 and brilliant. Uh, and lastly, to Armin and Ellen for launching this theme, which is so important and which you're so delighted to have at the heart of the LSE. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>